Namaskar and welcome to Language Learning Made Easy. In today's lecture, I'm going to teach you a sonnet by Percy Bysse Shelley, Ozymandias, which is a very important sonnet covered in class 10 English communicative syllabus. Let's get started. Now, Ozymandias is a sonnet which has been written by Percy Bysse Shelley, which I have already told you. It was published in 1818. Now, who is Percy Bysse Shelley? He is a romantic poet. He is referred to as a romantic poet. The word romantic here is interesting to note because it does not imply what it literally means. Okay, Romantic is something that is derived from the word romance, which means taking a flight into the realm of imagination. Okay, So when you are writing, when you are referred to as a romantic poet, you will be referring to things in your own way and you will be, you know, it will be a very different uh, take on things as opposed to what you get to read in other works. Okay, So uh, before this romantic age, we used to have this classical age or Augustan age where writings used to be absolutely scientific and clinical. People would not enjoy them, right? So there came a time when uh, this wave, this French revolution came into being and then the romantic era came into the, you know, came, came into being and we got to know that there are older generation of romantic poets and then came the younger generation of romantic poets. So older generation of romantic poets has a different style of writing poems. They would, uh, Wordsworth, P.B. Coleridge, you would have heard about their names, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge and uh, William Blake, these were the main poets or the prominent poets which formed the older you know, category of romantic poets. We don't need to get into details about these poets but I can very well tell you that uh, the younger generation of romantic poets comprised of poets like P.B. Shelley, John Keats and Byron. Right? You will be reading about P.B. Shelley in this particular poem and uh, John Keats in class 12th English course syllabus. Byron will be a part of your syllabus when you are going to take up English literature in your graduation. But without further ado, let's understand what was the ideology or how did P.B. Shelley used to write. P.B. Shelley always was considered to be a democratic poet. He was somebody who would not, never choose to go with something that was powerful. Right? He would hate autocratic rule, he would hate the rule of monarchy, he would hate totalitarianism, he would hate absolutism. So he would always believe that the power does not, you know, it should not be given to just one person or one authority, it should always be distributed and given to people who are responsible for its creation. Right? So he believed in the power of people and that is why whatever he wrote was for the people, by the people, of the people, right? And a reflection of this particular ideology will be clearly seen in this particular sonnet that we are going to read. Now what is a sonnet? That's for you to understand. A sonnet is a 14 line poem. It's usually divided into two parts. The first part which is 8 lines is referred to as octave, okay? It is referred to as octave and the last 6 lines are referred to as sestet. I'm going to give you these terms at the end of this uh, poem, so don't worry if you've not noted them down. Now let's understand what I've written here. I've told you who a romantic poet is. A romantic poet is a person who takes a flight into the realm of imagination. Now what is so peculiar about the writing of P.B. Shelley is the way he believes in, is the way he believes in democratic rule of the country, that it should be the power of the people to choose whom they want to be led by, right? It should not be, uh, it should not be the authority of a single person or a single authority, right? It should always be distributed, it should always belong to the people. Let's move to the next slide. Now we'll talk about the theme of this particular poem, but uh, without further ado, let's start with the sonnet first. Now if you will take a look at your book, you will be able to see this beautiful picture that's there on its uh, front page. It says, can you see this picture? It's a picture of a statue and these are two vast trunkless, you know, they are trunkless legs that you're able to see. When I say trunkless, that means there are no, you know, the, the upper part or the torso of the body is not seen. Only two legs which have been truncated from the upper part of the body can be clearly seen. Now if you look at the backdrop, the backdrop seems to be that of a vast desert and there is a there is this face of the statue, you know the face of the statue which seems to have been truncated, which seems to have been cut from the body and it seems to be lying on the, you know, it, it seems to be lying on the desert half sunk in it. 
can you see it's half sunk in it so it seems that the probably some damage has happened to this statue and it has probably been dilapidated over the period of time it has suffered a lot of devastation and that is why it seems to be in a broken position like this now why would shelley want to start his sonnet with something like this don't you think it's a very negative sort of an image or uh, it's something it's probably trying to tell you something which he has a firm belief in right if you think so then let's uh, take a look forward at the poem and then probably you'll be able to draw a correlation with his ideology and the poem that he has written so it starts off by saying i met a traveler from an antique land i met a traveler so the narrator the poet himself met a person probably a traveler who has been to an antique land and he says uh, he is talking about his conversation with him now when he was talking to this man he would have told something about the land that he paid a visit to what did the man say to him what did the traveler say to him two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert can you see what he says this traveler says that there were two vast vast means huge so you can very well understand that these legs are not too small it belongs to a statue that was monumental that was huge that was big that was gigantic and here also the same thing is happening so these two legs and va two vast and trunkless legs of stone trunkless means the upper torso or the upper part of the body was missing so he came across this statue which contained two vast legs which were made up of stone and they stood in the desert so the, you can see that there is a pedestal here on which these legs are uh, stationed okay so they were standing or they were resting on that pedestal which which was in the backdrop of a desert half near them on the sand half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those fashions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed please try and understand what's happening here is he says He says, near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage. Near them on the sand. Now again, I would like to take you, uh, uh, you know, I would like you to take a look at this picture, in which you can see that the face is already truncated from the body. All right, and it seems to be half sunk. Why is it sunk? Because it seems to be sunk in the desert. Probably it has fallen off, or it got shattered, and because of which it is lying in the sand, and it's probably getting sunk in the sand. a shattered visage shattered means it's broken visage is the face it's shattered it's absolutely broken whose frown now when you will take a closer look at the face then you will take a closer look at the face of the statue which is half sunk in the sand you will be able to see that there is a frown on the face frown means a wrinkle you know when you are angry at somebody or when you are to you know whatever you are from inside it tends to reflect on your face so this is what you need to understand here also probably the poet is trying to tell you something about the there was something about this statue about the person whose statue has been created and whose face we are looking at and who is this person it is ozymandias himself you will get to know as we read so he is wearing a face uh, you know he is wearing a frown on his face ha and wrinkled lip his lip is slightly wrinkled you know when your when your lips are slightly wrinkled like this you can very well imagine that the person is uh, angry or uh, you know he is personifying the traits that he uh, carries within himself okay he is he is actually wearing those traits all up, all over his face it clearly tells you that the person would have been commanding in nature you know he would have been dominating in nature or he would have definitely been a very tyrannical person during his lifetime there is also a sneer of cold command about his face sneer means the look about his face you know the sneer you know the way he is looking at uh the 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 expressions that he's carrying on his face the expression about his eyes that frown about his eye this tells you that he must have had a cold command during that time that means he seems to be very patronizing in nature somebody who is very dominating in nature somebody who believes in absolutism somebody who believes in totalitarianism somebody who believes in crushing people and crushing their might and power altogether proving himself over everyone else okay so probably he is trying to tell you something as great as that now when you look at the 
you know visage of this uh, visage means the face of this statue closely these are the expressions which are apparent on the face of it okay they are apparently coming out they are the ones that are coming out to you uh, very very clearly and what is it that you are able to understand that tell that it sculptor well those passions read that means the way it has been created you can very well uh, feel you can very well sense that the sculptor who created this statue sculptor who sculpted this statue has understood the kind of person ozymandias or this particular person was so he has well those passions read means he has been able to understand the kind of personality he had he may appear to be somebody from outside but what he was from inside can clearly be felt when you take a look at his statue so sculptor has done his duty pretty well now even after his death you can see tell that it sculptor well those passion thread which yet survive that means even after so many years of this statue being made even after so many years of its devastation even after so many years that we don't even know how for how long has it been destroyed or devastated or how long this visage has been lying half sunk in the desert we don't know when this devastation happened but this statue would have been made long time back right even after years of the statue being made we can still see that these expressions about the face remain there is no you know the 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 look expression about the face of the statue remains untouched it remains as they were so it clearly tells you the hand that marked them and the heart that fed what was the intention of the sculptor behind creating these statue maybe he wanted you to understand the kind of rule that people used to live under or the kind of time that they have been through the kind of person whom they were ruled by and the kind of dominating dominating nature he had and the you know although he seems to be sculpting it out through his hand but his hand is mocking the expression his hand is mocking he's taking a dig at the at the king's power and position okay although he seemingly seems to be doing something that the king wanted him to do he wanted him to uh, feel immortalized he wanted him self to become permanent okay he wanted the posterity to remember him but what has he got in return he has got something like this in return the sculptor has created a statue but we are all laughing at it because we can clearly see through the expressions we can clearly make out what kind of a person he was which probably the king would not have wanted right so this is where the octave ends now let's move on to the sestet part that is the last six lines of the sonnet and on the pedestal these words appear now when you take a look at this pedestal on which the vast trunkless legs of stone are standing you will be able to see that there is an inscription there now what does the inscription say my name is ozymandias king of kings look upon my work see mighty and despair these two lines are in quotation marks that means these are the direct words spoken by ozymandias which are engraved on the pedestal what do they mean my name is ozymandias it is the statue of ozymandias he is claiming himself to be the ultimate power he thinks of himself as the king of kings as if there is nobody who can stand uh, you know uh, who, who can stand in front of him in terms of his achievements and fame look upon my works he is inviting everyone it's a it's a very you know commanding sort of a claim that he is making it's a very arrogant and haughty sort of a claim that he is making he wants people to see what he has done he wants people to take a look at his achievements and feel a sense of jealousy within them right because they have never been able to achieve what he has been able to do during his lifetime so he says i want each one of you to come here and look at my works and feel despair feel a sense of jealousy feel a sense of sadness because of what i have been able to achieve and what you have not been able to achieve now let's dissect these lines and i to understand what is it that it means um, you know when you are trying to analyze it this person had claimed to be the most powerful being during that time and that is why probably he thought of getting his statue made right now understand this person who claimed himself to be the king of kings is no longer alive to see what has happened to his own statue the statue has already been devastated by the you know by the strength of time so what does it tell you it is telling you something about the theme of the poem that time is all pervasive time is omnipotent or time is something that will never let any power rest 
okay that will never let any uh, power prevail through the period of time okay so it's the most ultimate power this is what you have to understand so we should not ever underestimate the power of time so this is very ironical the person who was claiming himself to be the king of kings who was claiming himself to be the universal power himself does not know what is happening to his statue right he does not know that he is statue itself does not remain as a testimony to what he used to be at that point of time nothing besides remain round the decay of that colossal wreck so when you look around that colossal huge wreck means destruction when you look around that destruction boundless and bare the lone and level sand stretch far away so all you are able to see around is there is no accommodation nothing at all you see devastation which is and desert which is you know sweeping across the entire place so it's a very ironical end to the poem because we were not expecting Aussie Mandias to have such a petty sort of a life uh, uh, you know after his death this is what his uh, life seems to have taken a turn on so it clearly tells you that number 1 uh, your uh, power is transient human life and power is absolutely transient and what is the most ultimate power it's the power of time right so this takes us to the theme of this particular um, sonnet it talks about tyranny tyranny means destruction then transient nature of life which i've just talked about and power and its depiction in art so it can clearly be seen in the way it has been written down or the way it has been shown in the statue both are forms of art only how time and art are permanent through the pages of history if there's something that's going to remain through the pages of history it's time as well as art nothing can devastate them nothing can destroy them nothing can ravage them right now let's like uh, take a look at the poetic devices metaphor has been used in statue of ozymandias extended metaphor has been used throughout the poem because ozymandias is not just a king he is also a symbol of power legacy and command so you can see what happens to him throughout the uh, you know throughout the sonnet because we are just talking about him and him being compared with something called power legacy and command now personification has been used what is personification personification means that you are uh, according life to an inanimate object okay when you are endowing life to something which is non living then that is personification wrinkled lip can a statue have a wrinkled lip can a statue have a sneer of cold command no these looks or these kind of traits are uh, you know are uh, associated with somebody who is living but here they've been accorded to a non living thing that is a statue and that is why it is personification imagery has been used you know you have to imagine everything that is happening around you you have to imagine a vast uh, desert you have to imagine those vast trunkless legs of stones and when you imagine the desert when you imagine the shattered face wrinkled lip all these things involve your senses and that is why you can say that imagery has been used all over alliteration has been used in these two phrases cold command k k sound that means this consonant sound is being repeated after regular intervals boundless and bare so b b sound is being repeated again alliteration in jamman means lines that end without a punctuation marks right so they are trickling over from one line to the other in jamman has been used in almost the entire poem you can see from line 1 to line 8 this is called in jamet there is no punctuation it's just going on and on and on right so in this line particularly i met a traveler from this line onwards to stand in the desert there is no punctuation in between it ends over there only so it's a line in continuation as an ends that means repetition of vowel sounds in the same line stand sand a sound is being repeated well read a sound is being repeated irony is the other poetic device that has been used and irony lies in the fact that what is adim uh, ozymandias claiming himself to be this can be clearly seen in the entire poem in the octave part and then in the sestet part what do we see he is claiming himself to be the king of kings but the irony of the situation is that not even his statue prevails not even his statue remains as a testimony to his power and his uh, authority over people right so that is ironical then we have cynic ducky in this line the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed how do you write cynic ducky cynic ducky 
when one part symbolizes the whole so whose hand is being talked about and whose heart is being talked about it's the sculptor's hand that is being talked about and it's mocking at the expressions of the king okay now moving on let's take a look at the rhyme scheme the rhyme scheme is a b b a a b b a in the octave part and then c d c d c d in the sestet part now taking a look at the structure and the form uh first eight lines i have already told you are referred to as octave the next six lines are referred to as sestet if you find four more lines in a poem like this then that refers to as quatrain with this we come to the end of this sonnet if you have any questions whatsoever you can post them in the comment section thank you so much have a good day you should see what i'm doing then